Alhamdulillah Inna alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina Wa min sayyati a'malina Man yahdihi Allah fa huwa al-muhtad Wa man yudlil fa la hadiya lah Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu La sharika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sahabihi wa sallam قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد As we all know recently there was a tragic incident that took place in New Zealand and it's very heartbreaking, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of those who passed away, may Allah make them shuhada, ameen, ya rabbil alameen. <coughs> Our reaction, the most typical reaction when things like this take place, is that everybody says, what should we do? What's the plan? And in my opinion, there's a flaw in the question. By saying, what should we do and what's the plan, you're admitting that you don't already have a plan. You're admitting that you didn't have anything in motion up until this triggered you and made you realize we should have a plan. So, and then what typically happens is the emotion is red hot for the first, let's say, week, <coughs> roughly. And then after that week, you start to cool off. So all the different opinions that were thrown around as to what we should do next it all starts to die down, fade away, and eventually nobody really cares anymore until, of course, the next tragedy, and then everybody's asking the same question again. What should we do? Now they have to reinvent it and re re come up with a whole new question and uh, 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 propositions that, again, will be forgotten a week, within a week's time. I believe that this is an insufficient cycle. This is an, an embarrassing quality that we find in many Muslim communities, including our own, and that we should be a little bit more mature in our approach and we should think to ourselves, no, it's not about how hot I get, how emotional I get, it's about thinking long term. It's about having a plan that doesn't just last for a week or so, or how can we react to this particular situation. Just the idea of being reactionary is insufficient, rather we should be proactive and it shouldn't just be a question of whatever the topic is of the day, like for example security or you know, security guards and things like this. It should be how can we strengthen the foundations of our ummah? How can we improve Islam in our city? How can we be involved in this process? And anytime something happens, we should be even more, uh, 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 have even more resolve in that regard. And so, with that in mind, I'd like to outline to you what the Quran describes as the Prophet Sallallahu mission. Because if we are going to be the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if we are going to continue on that mission, then we should know, we should be familiar with the description of that mission. We should have an idea as to what job he had. And uh, subhanAllah, the way Allah describes it in Surah Jum'ah, how appropriate to be talking about it today, on the day of Jum'ah, the way Allah describes it is quite in incredible and deserves our attention. Allah Subhanahu Wa tells us, هُوَ الَّذِي It is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمْهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ This ayah is really something to marvel over. It is something truly magnificent. Let's take a look at it. Allah says what? It is He, it is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who has sent to the illiterate people, as in, as if to say, look, this is a formula that you can uh, apply even from the you know, uh, base from the, from the ground up. Somebody, if you're dealing with a group of people that have no education, no prior knowledge whatsoever, this is the way you build them up to become the leaders of mankind. Here is, I'm going to give you the formula that is going to make the lowest of the low into the greatest of the greats. So they are from the Ummiyin. This, these people have no prior education. And then Allah does what? 
رسولا, he sends a messenger منهم, from amongst them as in he should be from those people as in he should be familiar with that language and with that culture and so forth and what are the three verbs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet ﷺ doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses three different action verbs which are action items and this is exactly what we need to imitate and in the order Look, pay attention to the each verb and the order. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmah. Let's pay attention and focus on each one individually. The first one is tilawah. The second one, tazkiyah. And the third one is ta'aleem. That is the mustar. These, these are the infinitives of these verbs. Let's understand them with some more depth though. Tilawah is to recite. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi means I'm going to basically like give you an introduction to this deen. That's the first job of the Messenger Sallallahu That's the first job of all of us as Muslims who want to convey this message. We need to give something, and Allah, by the way, when Allah uses, the, uses a word to describe the Qur'an, in the first place, Allah calls it ayatihi. And in the second, in, excuse me, in the third case, it's wal kitab, in the, in the third, so I'll explain in a moment. Why does Allah describe it as reciting the ayat? Because an ayah is something that is miraculous, something that grabs your attention. So what is this supposed to be? This means that we as a community need to introduce people to this deen. We need to give short, powerful reminders. And they need to be concise. They need to be eye-opening. They need to be captivating. They need to be inspiring. This is basically what every single imam does around this city when they give their khutbahs, when they give their halaqahs. There's no, it's not for any particular age group. It's not for, particularly for men or for women. It is open to all. You can come at when you like. You can leave when you like. It is very open-ended. And it is short. It is powerful. It's supposed to captivate you. That's stage one. That's what we're doing right now. Then there's stage two. Some people, they'll listen to this message. They'll appreciate it. And they'll go home. And they'll be inspired, inshallah ta'ala. And it'll affect them throughout the week. But then there's another group of people. A smaller group of people. And you see it every week. Somebody, a few, just a few people will walk up at the end of the khutbah and they'll come up and say, Imam, Shaykh, I have a few questions. You know, I'm involved in this type of uh, business transaction or I'm involved in this type of a relationship. I'm wondering, is this halal? Is this haram? They have questions. Why? Because the masses, when they listen to, inshallah ta'ala, uh, a strong message, an inspiring message, most of them, they go home and that benefits them throughout the week. But some people, they want to step higher than that. They say, I want to do tazkiyah. I want to purify my life. I want to make sure that I remove any haram elements. I have to go up to the imam. I have to go up to the shaykh and ask some questions. And it's our job to make sure that either we have the answer or we can say, wait, let me do research and I'll get back to you and give you the answer so that we can do tazkiyah. So that we can purify people and remove those haram elements from their life. So, stage one. Powerful reminders and introductions, like khutbahs and halaqahs. Stage two, you have to be able to answer questions about halal and haram so people can actually remove the haram elements from their life. That's tilawa and that's tazkiyah. What is the third stage? وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ This comes from the verb عَلَّمَ يُعَلِّمُ تَعْلِيمًا which means what? To teach. Stage three is teaching. And Allah doesn't say ayat. doesn't say يُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْآيَات. Allah says يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ What's the difference? One is emphasizing the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, something that is inspiring and grabs your attention. Kitab emphasizes law. Kitab emphasizes learning. And that's, it's so appropriate how it fits with the verb yu'allimu. It fits with the idea of teaching. So what does this imply? That, to make it really simple, let's use today as an example. The masses come to the Jummah khutbah, inshallah they hear a good khutbah, they get benefited, most of them leave, a few people have questions. So that's, so that's stage one is everybody. Then a few people from that, they will have questions and they try to purify themselves. That's stage two. But then there's a third stage, even higher than that. An even smaller minority. They stay behind and they say, Ya Shaykh, look. I've been coming and I've been listening to your khutbahs and your halaqahs for a while. You're trying to inspire us, I am inspired. You want, to be, you want me to be inspired? I am inspired. You did it. I've asked you many questions, I've tried to, you know, clarify different things about my lifestyle and what I'm studying and what I'm involved in in terms of money and this and that. I've asked you lots of questions. I want more. I appreciate your khutbahs, I appreciate your halaqahs, but I want more. I want a, a layer deeper than that. I want something even better than that. I want to really study this deen. And what does that imply? يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ hikmah implies schooling. It's not like a half an hour or 20 minute khutbah or halaqah. We're talking about what? We're talking about 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. all the way till uh, 3 or 4 o'clock. Classes, real classes with books, with 
uh, 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 homework with notes. With I mean, you don't find people taking notes. This is not a class. This is just an inspiring speech. But what they want is more. They want uh, textbooks. They want examinations. They want grades, etc. They want to be taught. This is what is being described here when you look at these three. Now, I believe that as a community, alhamdulillah, we are offering number one. We have imams throughout this city offering khutbas and halaqas to inspire the masses. And yes, alhamdulillah, we have imams and uh, people to answer questions for anybody who's interested. But what we don't have is we don't have a school. And that's understandable. It doesn't make sense in a very small community like our community to have a, uh, an entire Islamic school. So it makes more sense to actually outsource. It makes more sense that when we have those very few and far between individuals who come up and say, I want to learn Arabic. I want to, ha I want to study ulum uh, al-Quran, uh, mustalah uh, al-Hadith. I want to study aqidah. I want to study usul al-fiqh and fiqh. I want to study sirah. I want to really study this deen. It pains me to know that I don't have anything to offer them. I mean, imagine it from my perspective. I spend my time thinking of the best way to inspire somebody. And then somebody says, you did it, I'm inspired. What can you offer me? And my answer is nothing. I don't have anything for you. Yes, it's like a bait and switch, you understand? I've baited them in and now I have nothing. This is not acceptable. We need to understand that it is our job to not only offer khutbas and halaqas to inspire. But stage two, we also have to be able to answer people's questions and clarify this deen for them when they have questions. But as a third level, we need to be able to teach people. And if we don't have the school because this is a smaller community, that's okay. We can still send them somewhere. There are many different Islamic schools in this country and abroad. But we need to focus on those in individuals. We need to make sure that we are catering to them, inshallah ta'ala. Now, before I go on, I want to highlight just how important it is to focus on this third group, this extreme minority, because they are so precious. I don't think most of us appreciate how precious it is when somebody from this community says, I want to dedicate a year of my life or maybe two years of my life to really study and become grounded in Islam. Most of us, we think, oh, that's nice. And then we just move on. Let me explain and let me hopefully paint a picture that will allow you to appreciate these individuals more. First and foremost, we are a minority in this city, everybody, and in this country. So the Muslims are a minority. Of that minority, the majority of that population is either older and therefore are working with family, wife, kids, etc., and they don't have time to dedicate to Islamic studies. Or they're younger, they're children, and they can't go and study anywhere. So we're talking about now a minority within a minority. We're talking about the Muslims that are, let's say, late teens, early 20s. They're at that sweet spot in their life where they actually have the ability to be independent, but they're not bogged down with responsibilities. Now, of that minority of a minority, the majority of them, sorry if this is a little confusing, the majority of the Muslims that are, let's say, between late teens and early 20s, most of them are only concerned with partying, with video games, with running away from Islam, not running towards Islam. So now we're talking about a minority of a minority of a minority. You get my point. So few of them actually have the passion towards Islam. Now, of those who do, which again are such a small minority, most of them are tied up with high school, their bachelors, their masters, which is good, alhamdulillah. But every once in a while, there is this tiny window of opportunity where they say, I'm finishing my high school, before I do my bachelor's, I want to study Islam for one year. I want to learn the Arabic language. I want to really understand this Quran. When I see someone like this, or let's say between their bachelor's and their master's, I'm finishing my bachelor's this year, I'm going to go to my master's, but I want in that one year, while I'm still single, I don't have children, I'm not working just yet. In between, I want to take that golden opportunity, this tiny window of opportunity, I want to take it and study Islam. In my opinion, these people are the, our most precious natural resource. We don't want to waste it. We don't want to squander it. So if you're asking the question to yourself, what is our plan going forward? My estimation, my opinion is, find those youth. Find those people who want to study deen and give them that one year. Give them those two years. Let them study their deen and then come back and continue their secular studies. There's nothing wrong with that. Let them become proficient in whatever field they want to. And that way they can combine their worldly studies as well as their studies about the akhirah. They can be good practicing Muslims moving into the workforce. That's the ideal. That's what we want. And so, we should always remember that these people are so precious and they're so few and far between. 
In fact, the Prophet sallallahu said, min ashrat al-sa'ati an yurfa' al-ilmu wa yathbut al-jahl. That it is from the signs of the last hour that knowledge will be taken away and ignorance will prevail. So, what I'm trying to say is that if you study Islam, if some of these few young people want to really understand their deen, then they are a, an increasingly rare and precious commodity that only rises in value as time goes forward. Because as time goes forward, they become more and more rare and precious. And it is painful when I have those few people that are interested in studying deen, and subhanAllah, I'm looking to the community to support them, and the answer is, I don't really see the value in it. I don't really see the point. There's, it's, it's, it's truly heartbreaking. And I'm going to continue this topic, inshallah ta'ala, in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslimin kathira. Bismillah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I want to clarify that the objective is not to create a large number of Imams. I'm not talking about that. Studying for Islam for one or two years does not make you an Imam. It makes you grounded and solid and strong in your Islamic studies and strong in your deen, but it doesn't make you an Imam. So if somebody thinks that, oh, this brother Nasser, he wants to promote and make all of our children Imams, that is not the case. That is not the reality. However, what I would love to see and what is my dream for this community is to create a steady stream every year we have two or three or four or five young people to go and study Islam for, uh, for perhaps that year, maybe two years, and then they come back to their community. And this is the problem that this has taken place in many other communities, including this community in the past. But I believe that where, where we fell short was that we put our trust in maybe one or two people. And we thought, oh, they show talent, therefore we're going to send them to study, we're going to bring them back, and they're going to transform the city. That's not the way things work. You can't, as they say, put all of your eggs in one basket. I believe you need a steady stream of people going and coming, going and coming. Why is that necessary? Because some people, they become busy with work. Some people have health issues. Some people have to change, move to another city. You can't expect one person to do the whole job. You create a steady stream because from amongst them, perhaps inshallah, we will see the, the likes, the production of the, uh, of the likes of the next Malcolm X, the next uh, Yasir Qadi, the next great uh, hero of Islam inshallah ta'ala. That is what we hope to see inshallah ta'ala, but you have to do that through bulk. You can't simply just invest in a few people and expect them to change everything. I believe that the, when you study, when you pay attention to the history of Islam in the West, you notice that during the 70s and 80s, there was a very, very, very small number of Muslims in the, in the Western world, and it is at that time, or roughly, that they, a, a large, large waves of immigration started coming to the West. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jazahumullahu khayran, may Allah bless that entire generation, those elders who are now becoming older, because it is that generation that transformed the Western world from having basically close to zero masajid, to now, alhamdulillah, thousands of masajid all over, the United States and Canada, all over the Western world, you find masajid all over. So we can do nothing but be grateful for that generation who came and built these masajid. However, it is also very important that we pay attention and realize that if we keep thinking that we're going to keep using the same formula, then we are delusional. If my generation, the younger generation that is now coming up and taking the reins, if we think that we're just going to keep building masajid, then we're going to keep building empty masajid. The Prophet ﷺ, absolutely, it is, it is from the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, the first thing he did was build the masjid. But after the masjid was built, was the objective to just keep building more and more construction, make it larger and taller and more beautiful? No, that was not the objective. Yes, maintenance is necessary, but the objective was not focusing on places, but focusing on people. You want to invest in human beings. You want to invest in developing individuals that are knowledgeable in their deen. That has to be the shift in focus. The shift from focusing on places like masajid to people and uh, 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 scholarship programs. That is what is necessary for us to focus on. Oftentimes, unfortunately, we will hear some people, they will criticize that and say, well, this person, I don't know how influential they are. I don't know how, how charismatic this person is. I don't know how much of an impact such and such a person will, will have. I'm not sure if they're worth investing into. If that is your attitude, then I would like to remind you 
that the Prophet ﷺ was once giving da'wah to one of the heads of Quraysh, uh, of Quraysh. And as he was trying to convince him of Islam, somebody came to him. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum عنه, came to him and started asking questions. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't say anything negative to him. The Prophet ﷺ did not say any hurtful words. The Prophet ﷺ simply had a small frown. Just a, a little bulge on the forehead. Just a little bit of a frown. Keep in mind that he's frowning towards somebody who is blind. So that means that it wasn't even seen. There was no offense taken. It's impossible. He couldn't see it. And yet Allah saw it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only saw it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayat about it. And we all know Surah 80. The Prophet ﷺ frowned and turned away because there came to him a blind man. But what would make you understand and perceive that perhaps he wants to be purified? And yet instead you're focusing on somebody who, yes, he is influential, but he's not taking it seriously. So we don't want to uh, 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 fall into that. We don't want to uh, repeat this type of uh, action. What we would rather do is say, the important thing to do is to do what? Is, that we don't want to become distracted from the one who is sincere. We want to focus on the one who is sincere. Even if we think that this person might have a lot of charisma or a little. The, what's important is that they have the desire. What's important is that they're showing the passion for Islam. And we should be the first to say, this is the legacy of the Prophet To make sure that the one who shows interest in Islam, this precious resource of a, of a young individual who has that gap year that is able to study his deen, I want to make sure that I provide for them. I want to make sure that I uh, uh, support them so that we can send them, we can teach them, and bring them back inshallah so they can benefit our community. This is absolutely a necessity. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, I've been here for approximately one year in this community. And in that time, it has been my, I could say almost primary mission to pay close attention to this community and to try to find those few and far between precious individuals. And believe me, as somebody who's been searching for them, I can tell you just how rare they are, they are. Extremely rare and extremely precious. And alhamdulillah, thus far I found for this next upcoming sem uh, September, I have found three individuals who seem extremely dedicated towards studying Islam. And alhamdulillah, we have great uh, community members, wealthy community members who are willing to sponsor them and provide for them. So all I ask is from, from the general masses is that if you know of young people, that the, the types of which that I've just described, that are interested in studying Islam, that have that passion and that zeal and they want to learn their deen and then come back to this community and benefit this community, please put me in contact with them. And if you'd like to be part of those elders, part of those, that community of sponsors, also please come up to me and let me know so that inshallah we can make you part of those who sponsor them as well, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who always support this deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who always, take, uh, who always are looking forward to the progress of this deen 5, 10, 15 years down the line. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who, like Zakaria alayhi salam, are only thinking about the next generation, who are always thinking about how to educate our youth and have people who know this deen, understand this deen, and will propagate it into the future. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt, wa afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa barik lana fi ma a'atayt, wa qina sharr ma qadayt, fa inna ka تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت ربنا آتنا في دنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سيما كثيرا وأقم الصلاة